The love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion, the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. As we gather, we join in the call to worship. We gather looking back to see the paths taken and how they have shaped us. We honor those who have gone before us. Learning from their failures and successes. We celebrate who we are today. And welcome the possibilities and opportunities before us. We gather to worship God. The, the God, God of, of yesterday, yesterday today, today, and, and tomorrow. tomorrow. Our opening hymn is number 474, The Love of God Comes Close. on this anniversary Sunday as we celebrate 133 years of faithful ministry in Christ through Knox Waterloo. Today we honor our past, embrace our present, and together we look ahead with anticipation for all the ways we will grow through Christ into the future. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning, whether you are worshiping in person in the building or live streaming or listening on radio or watching later on YouTube. We are all part of this community together. Welcome to the bruised and the broken, to 
the whole and the healing, welcome to the lonely and the connected, the bereaved and the joyful, the practically perfect and the supposed screw up. Welcome strangers, sojourners and siblings in Christ. Welcome indigenous peoples and newcomers. Welcome full of life children, questioning youth, weary parents and committed seniors. Welcome gay, straight, lesbian, transgender, non-binary, bisexual, queer, intersex, two-spirited. Welcome married, single, divorced, or none of the above. Welcome children of God, you are beloved. We welcome today our guest preacher, Reverend Teresa McDonald Lee. Teresa is the co-executive director at Camp Kintail on Lake Huron with her husband, Jonathan. Together they have three beautiful children, Ella, Lucy, and Anna. Teresa is an avid reader and is always interested in what everyone else is reading too. She is passionate about inclusion, justice, and reconciliation ministries. We are so glad she is here with us today. Let us continue to worship in prayer. God of all seasons, God of all time, God of all words, we come. We come as we are, out of time, out of sorts, out of reason, yet seeking to be. Reasons to be, and most of all, to be calm in your presence, ready to listen and know and follow and grow. Holy God, we come as a people who would like to think that we love you with all our hearts, our souls, and our might. But there are many other things in our lives that clamor for our attention, that We often relegate you to Sundays and times when we want you to rescue us. Most of us really want you to be the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We really want to hear your voice above all other things in our lives. But we get bogged down in the daily routine. We forget who we are we forget who you are. We forget that the church, what the church is supposed to be. So here we are, standing, sitting before you with all our human foibles and our short attention spans, asking that you would make yourself known to us, that you would help us to recognize the presence of the holy, that you would continue to challenge us, inspire us, and make us into the people you call us to be, that we might love you with our whole selves and pass along this love to each generation so that your kingdom might be made known. Let us now join together in singing the prayer that Jesus taught us.
Today, we remember Knox's founders and builders, people who had a dream for a church in this place, people who helped it to grow, people who, ca- who created space for worship, for study, for faith to be nurtured, people who formed a connection with the surrounding community. We remember those who lit the light of faith. And as we light their candle representing the past, we pray, don't let the light go out. As it has shone for so many years, may it shine through your love and through our love and our service, representing God's presence in this congregation. Friends, hear the good news. God is the love that over and around us lies, the grace that is totally unearned, and the healing that makes the world whole. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. everybody. So my name is Teresa, as Courtney has introduced me, but I am also a camp director in addition to being a minister, and so at camp I am called Trillium. So I've had the privilege of meeting some of you and hopefully some of the kids um, on uh, Zoom at home. I've met them before at Camp Kintail. But today um, I wanted to ask, who here has ever had to plan a party before? Anybody plan a party? I'm not a very great party planner because there's so many details that need to be looked after. So um, you have to figure out who you're going to invite. Um, Is it a dinner party? Is it a barbecue? Are you outside, inside? What if it rains? Who's going to sit beside each other? Do they get along? You got to plan the menu. You have to think about where everybody's coats are going to go. You've got to clean your bathroom. Sometimes maybe that's the reason I don't like to have a party. It's because there's lots of cleaning involved. It's a lot of work to have a party. And for the kids who planned a birthday party before, you know it can be really tricky to figure all of those details out. Um, Do you have your treat bags ready? There's just so many different things to a party that you have to organize. And I can hardly imagine doing it for 10. Has anyone here ever had to organize something for 100 people before? Some of you? 1,000 people before? Thousands and thousands of people? That's hard to imagine. But I'm going to tell you about a saint of the church today. I don't know if the picture's going to come up. This is um, Bayard Rustin. Does anybody know who Bayard Rustin is? I promise you, you might, even if you don't know who Bayard Rustin is, you definitely know what he has done. He is the civil rights activist that helped organize the big um, event on... uh, Um, Washington, where Martin Luther King Jr. gave his very famous I Have a Dream speech. So that speech and that day um, goes down in civil rights history that changed America, Canada, and really the world. We're all still remembering that speech and that day. But Bayard Rustin was the man who did all of the organizing of that party. Party, march, demonstration, that opportunity to be together. 
He looked after every detail and only had a few weeks to plan. He had to plan transportation for everybody. He had to plan where they were going to stay, um, what message was most important to get out there that day, what the signs were going to say, how everybody could fit into that space safely. He had to plan the porta potties. He had to plan um, who was going to sit up on the stage and which order they were going to speak to have the largest impact. Um, he did all of this work to plan this enormous event with thousands and thousands of people. And he even had to organize the people who were going to clean up the garbage that evening so that nobody would complain the next day that they had left um, the National Mall in um, a mess. Now, there's lots of reasons. Sometimes we don't always um, remember the people who do the organizing behind the scenes. But one of the reasons we don't know Bayard Rustin's name is because he was a gay man in the 1960s. And other civil rights organizers were worried that if others knew that a gay man was doing the organizing, their efforts might not have as much impact. And so while he was known as the most brilliant organizer in the whole civil rights movement, he didn't have a front of um, the, the movement face that we all recognize. Now Bayard was born and was raised by his grandparents and they were Quaker. And he strongly um, believed in peace, and he lived that out through his whole life. Um, he refused to be drafted for the Second World War, and he went to jail. And after he got out of jail, he went to um, do some civil rights work in the South with integrating busing in the 40s, long before we think of um, the busing um, protests that happened. And he did that, and again, he was thrown into jail, and he worked on a chain gang, and then he wrote articles about working on a chain gang that helped to stop some of those um, practices from happening. He went to India, he studied with Gandhi, and when he came back to the United States, he was convinced of nonviolence as the way forward um, for peace and for activism. And he was one of the ones that taught Martin Luther King Jr. about the way of nonviolence. Um, and he went on through his entire life to continue to advocate for those who needed to be advocated for. And he said, um, I do this work um, for peace and equality, not just because I'm a black man, not just because I'm a gay man, but because I believe everyone is part of the same family and deserves the same love and respect. And I learned this at my grandparents' knees in our Quaker congregation. And so today we celebrate, um, as this time of year, we celebrate in the church, the saints of the church, and um, hopefully this morning we will remember Bayard Rustin and his incredible work of organizing and motivating and encouraging and working towards love and justice for all. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for this church full of troublemakers and saints the ones who make things happen behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, the one who, ones who work towards justice and love and peace and equality. We give you thanks for those saints in our own life and for all those around the world who continue to do your work. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. As we look today on this anniversary Sunday to the past, the present, and the future, I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to introduce you to our newest scholar, not a new face by any means, but in this new role. So please welcome Cassidy Ward, who's going to come and sing a song called Future. Great 
your eyes. Faith brings you to your world. Breathe in the air. It's a gift. Come on, just let it in. Your best days are still ahead. Laugh like you meant it. I can't contain it. Hope in the here and now. What a wide horizon in the rush of heaven. Laugh like you meant it. I want to live it wilder than all my dreams. Such a great adventure. Welcome to the future. Love like you meant it. I can't contain it. Hope in the here and now. What a wide horizon in the rush of heaven. Love like you meant it. I want to live it wilder than all my dreams. Such a great to the future. I know who holds. I know who holds. Who holds. I know who holds tomorrow. Wilder than all my dreams. Such a great adventure. Welcome to the Thank you so much, Cassidy, for sharing your gifts with us today. We celebrate today the present. Those of us who are here and now living as the body of Christ in and through Knox Waterloo. We give thanks for the gifts that are being shared by people of all ages and stages. We are grateful for the many ministries that continue to be alive at Knox Waterloo, worship, faith formation, pastoral care, mission and outreach, inclusion, justice and reconciliation ministries. We pledge ourselves to make good use of what our ancestors have passed down to us. And we light the candle for the here and now and commit ourselves to being present in our calling this day. May our light not go out. May this light illumine our minds and our hearts as we listen today to the scriptures being read and preached and interpreted. Let us pray. Loving God, you speak to us in so many ways, in the song of a bird, in the babbling of a brook, in the voices of our friends, in the embrace of family, in the lyrics of hymns, and in the stories of the Bible. God, your words have power, power to create, to disturb, to heal. Help us to hear your voice and follow the way of Christ. Amen. Our first reading is from Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 9. This contains a great confession of Israel's faith, as well as instructions to take the confession seriously. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the ordinance that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear there, O Israel, and observe them diligently, 
so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to join together in saying Psalm 146 responsively, and there's going to be a sung refrain, and MC is going to introduce us to that now. What does the Lord require to justly love mercy while comely with your God? You can join in at home now. I'll sing it one more time. What does the Lord require to justly love mercy while comely with your God? Praise the Lord. Praise, praise the, the Lord, Lord O my, soul. my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will, I will sing, sing praises, praises to my God, God all my life long. What does the Lord require to justly love mercy? Walk humbly with your God. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Who made, who made heaven and earth, and earth the sea, and, and all that is in them. them. Who keeps faith forever. Who, who executes, executes justice, justice for the oppressed. Who gives food, who gives food to, the to the hungry. What does the Lord require to justly love mercy? Walk humbly with your God. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord, the Lord opens, opens the, the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers and upholds the orphan and the widow. But the Lord brings the way of the wicked to ruin. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. What does the Lord require to justly love mercy walk humbly with your God? Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34, the first commandment. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked them, Which commandment is the first of them all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are no greater commandments than these. Then the scribe said to him, 
You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, and with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Greetings this morning again from Camp Kintail. I know this congregation has been a long time active and loyal supporter of both Cairn and Camp Kintail, and we are both very grateful for your ongoing support of children and outdoor ministry. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words on my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our refuge. Amen. I have a few personal rules that I have practiced and added to over time. And one of the most important is this. If a child asks to read with me, I will stop what I am doing to read. And this has been true for decades now, starting from when I was a babysitter and a camp counselor to becoming a parent, an aunt, and a camp director. If a camper wants another, cha another chapter of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I will read it, even if really it should be lights out. If a child wants to hear the same storybook for the fifth time in a day, I will do it, but then maybe I will hide the book under the couch cushions. <laughs> if one of my teenagers is willing to read a book out loud, you bet I am there. If my small friend Calvin wants to find Lowly the Worm in Richard Scary, you can guarantee I am on the floor beside him. I love to read. And for me, books opened up the world of imagination and adventure. And reading is the best way I know to introduce the world and all its complexities to children. In many ways, reading to and with a child is a small action, but it reflects my values. And so my rule keeps me from being too busy to do what really matters. And so, if a child asks me to read, I will stop what I am doing to read with them. I have other personal rules as well, and I'm sure you do too if you stop to think of it. Here are just a few that I follow or try to follow. When you hear a siren, always take a moment to pray for all those involved. Always read books recommended by campers. Now, that might be specific to me, but it's helped me read all sorts of books I would have never read before. Choose the homemade dessert at a potluck. Do the most important things first. Move your body every day. Make sure to go outside at least once a day. Over the last 18 months, I'm sure we have all discovered and created our own personal COVID rules as well mask wearing, hand washing, where, when, and how often we go to places. If we stop to think about it, I am sure that all of us have these spoken or unspoken rules that govern our decision making. The Bible is, of course, full of rules and commandments and instructions. And we who read the Bible, both the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures, sometimes glaze over when we think about all of the rules. There are our instructions for just about everything, what to eat and what to wear, instructions for worship and temple decorations and priest garments and sacrifices. There are the Ten Commandments, of course, including the one that is likely broken the most, keeping the Sabbath. There are rules for land ownership, debt collection, crop production, and holiday feasts. The rules are incredibly clear about caring for the widow, the orphan, and the alien. But there are a lot of them, all passed down orally and then written down in different centuries in different contexts. Even the scribes and teachers who spent their lifetime studying the scriptures struggled to interpret how they should follow the commandments in their own time. 
And this struggle sets up most of the conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus and the leaders argue over the interpretation and action and intent of the commandments in the Hebrew Scriptures. Before our reading today, Jesus had been engaged in what feels like a sparring match. The religious teachers bring question after trick question to Jesus, but Jesus doesn't pull any punches either, telling a story that makes the leaders look foolish to all those watching. But then the tone changes. A scribe comes forward after having listened to the verbal back and forth, and he comes with an earnest question. Jesus seems to welcome the question and the motivation behind it. The tense debate is over, and there is a real moment of exchange between the two teachers. To me, reading this story, it feels like I'm eavesdropping on a conversation between two people who are delighted in the wisdom and thinking of the other. Two people who have spent long hours poring over the scriptures, trying to tease out its meaning. The scribe's question is in many ways simple. What is the greatest command? But knowing the many laws and commands and rules that are available for this answer, it is not as simple as it looks. Different teachers have decided on what their rules are. Would the answer have to do with service or worship or crime or land, all of which were important? Jesus answers this way. The first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I can almost see the scribe nodding in delight as Jesus shared the familiar words from Deuteronomy and then Leviticus. Yes, yes, you are right, he says, and then repeats the commands that Jesus has just quoted. There is a meeting of the minds here, agreement and confirmation. The scribe then adds something new to the conversation, something that only the Gospel of Mark records. He adds his own thoughts to the commandment by stating, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Jesus hears the wisdom in the scribe's interpretation, maybe considering this thought for the first time. He responds by saying, you are not far from the kingdom of God. This is a most beautiful blessing, a compliment from one teacher to another. You are close to the kingdom of God. The realm of God is near. Note what it is that Jesus is commenting on. He is not merely agreeing with the scribe's confirmation of the greatest commandment. He is commenting on the scribe's additional interpretation. The scribe saw the wisdom in Jesus' response to his question and then pushed further. The scribe said, yes, these two commandments are the greatest and They are more important than our sacrifices and offerings. He does not say that sacrifices and offerings are not important, but says that they are not the most important. The scribe and Jesus identify that one thing is the most important, love. The greatest commandment is to love God and love neighbor. All else is less important, including the practicalities of worship. And with that, Jesus pronounces that the kingdom of God is close. As a congregation, you are beginning a process of thinking about the future. This is a conversation that you will have between each other, between you and God, and between you and your community. How do you as a congregation discover your communal framework for how you live and work and worship together now and into the future? How do you name your personal and community norms? How do you discern what it is you are called to do here in this place and in this time? 
you are about to begin a process and a conversation and a never-ending prayer. The scripture today would suggest that love must guide the process and the conversations. It can seem trite to suggest this, either because it seems so obvious or too sentimental. But Jesus says, when love is at the center and is the priority, the kingdom of God is not far. And so love, in all its messy, complicated expressions, must come first. And Jesus can be quite bossy on this front. Love your God, love your neighbor, love your enemy, love the world, love each other. No one and no thing are separate from his love, and we are to do likewise. This might seem like it would be easy to achieve in a church. After all, we are all here as we want to follow Jesus. But sometimes it is hardest in church with the people who we hope, think, and believe and act in similar ways to us. People we expect to act in one way, often our own way, but they often choose a different path. Our personal rules and norms are not another's, and it can frustrate us, especially when we are passionate. And so we must come back to love. For when we all put love as our highest priority, we are able to seek understanding and learn again. We recognize in our neighbor a human being loved by God who is doing their best. The scribe seems to rightly point out that worship and our life together in a faith community might be the cause of the greatest tension and the thing that keeps us from the greatest commandment. We cannot place our church or our understanding of what worship should be over love of God and love of neighbor. The first commandment, the greatest commandment, must be put in its proper place, at the very center. And the rest of us have to constantly reorient ourselves to this. But Jesus promises us that when we choose the greatest commandment, the commandment to love, the kingdom of God is not far. What greater gift for the future of this congregation and this community than to know that the kingdom of God is close? By drawing together in love, love for one another, love for the world, love for the neighbor, love for enemies, love for God, in this drawing together, may you sense that God is close. May you catch a glimpse of the kingdom of God. May you feel God's great love for you. And may you know that through your love, you are indeed calling the kingdom near. May it be so. Amen. Peace be with you. Teresa, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the gift you have given to us as a community of faith, for the, the, the grace, the comfort that you've just given, but the challenge that, that is, uh, accompanies a text like the one you've, you've delved into today. Thank you for reminding us the heart of who we are and who we are called to be, but to become. Thank you for that. And thank you for the ways that you touch the lives uh, of people through the ministries you do at Kintail. We as a congregation will continue to pray for you and your family and for the lives of those who are blessed through their association with Kintail. Thank you so very much, Teresa. We are so grateful. Uh, it was Teresa's job to remind you of the things that are most important, love one another. She mentioned that the tithes and offerings part is also important. That's my job. <laughs> uh, the reality is the churches of Christ rely on your generosity. And uh, we are so grateful for the gifts that continue to come in to support the ministries of, of Knox. The ministries of Christ as those ministries are embodied in the life and ministry of Knox Waterloo. It's, it's a really interesting tradition here at Knox that um, 
people are, those who are able are encouraged to give an, an extra amount at anniversary time, like $133, one for every year we've been. It doesn't have to be $133. One of the core values of us, uh, of Knox, is that it's, it's equal sacrifice, not equal gift. Some of you might be able to give 133 cents, and that would be a sacrifice, and we would be grateful. You might be able to give $13.30, which is 10 times more than that. Some of you might be able to give $133. Some of you might be able to give $1,330. Some of you might be able to give $13,300. <laughs> whatever multiple, <laughs> whatever gifts you can give, it's a blessing. It supports the work of Christ in Waterloo and around the world. And we are so grateful for the gifts that you have given, are giving today, and continue to give. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As we think about gifts and contemplate gifts given and gifts received, we sing together. Uh, what gift can we bring? For those of you at home following in your hymnal, it's number 798. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, MC. Thank you, Cassidy. Thank you, MC. Thank you to our tech crew today, Kathleen and Eric and Barb. Thank you to those who uh, welcomed at the door and showed us to the tables, uh, to our, the <laughs> I'm thinking lunch, <laughs> showed us to our pews. Uh, thank you. It takes so many people to make uh, worship happen, and we're grateful to one and all. Thank you to you who are tuning in online, listening in on CKWR Radio. Thank you to those of you who are present today. Our worship is, is made so much richer by your presence today. A couple of announcements, a couple of brief announcements. Uh, one of my rules, Teresa, is if I see a pile of leaves, I, I kick them around. And if you got leaves, then, then, and you don't want people to kick them around, then you can actually call Carol, uh, contact her, and we're doing a fundraiser for the Food Bank of Waterloo Region. Teams of youth are being assembled, so if you got leaves, let us know. Give a donation, and uh, we'll, uh, the world will be blessed. Uh, uh, also, uh, it's said that by some that in the music world, the music needs more cowbell. That's, I've heard that. But I think we also need more jazz. 
And we're so grateful to MC, who's planning on November the 13th a jazz, uh, a jazz event here at Knox Waterloo. And uh, if you'd like to stream online, then you can do so, and you can actually come in person as well. And you can contact the office or work through the seating reservation system we have uh, for, uh, for that. I think we've lost our, uh, our screen. Have, oh, there we go. We got it back. Thank you. Our tech team is the best in the world. Uh, as well, next week, don't forget, it, time changes. Time, we, we, clocks go back in the fall. So if you, come, um, if you come without changing your clock, you will enjoy an hour of meditation before worship begins. So. Uh, Teresa made reference, and you've been hearing over the past weeks about uh, Knox is excitedly and enthusiastically thinking about the future. Who are we going to be as we learn to live with and emerge from as much as we can <laughs> this pandemic? Uh, we're, we're doing a visioning process. Uh, the Futures Committee has, and the session of Knox Waterloo has been working hard to set up some really interesting, informative, and exciting conversations. And you can sign up. We want to hear from you. Everyone in this space, everyone at home, everyone listening on radio has something to offer to the conversation around who are we becoming as a community of faith. We want you to participate in this. Consider this an official invitation to you to participate. We are hosting... Good morning. Oh, Laurie is going to speak in just a moment, but I'm not done yet. <laughs> uh, it, I lost my train of thought. Maybe it is Laurie's turn to speak. Uh, th th this is going to be a, a wonderful thing for not. This is the beginning of a, a longer process. Uh, this year, we're going to be consulting. We're going to be hearing from you uh, around your vision, your ideas, around who we are and who we can become. So, uh, Laurie is going to, to say more about this. We've got some time set up for in-person and Zoom conversations. And we really, really, really encourage you to sign up and be a part of this. Let's hear from Lori. Good morning. Change. We live in a world defined by change. Accelerating technological change, globalization, climate change, a growing awareness of systemic inequalities, increasing political polarization. Moreover, we are just beginning to emerge from a pandemic whose repercussions we will be living with for a long time. This is a time of challenge, but also opportunity. How can we at Knox respond both proactively and creatively to this new normal in which we find ourselves? What is the direction in which the Spirit may be calling the Church? To answer these questions, the ministers in session of Knox will be engaging the congregation in a two-stage consultation process. This fall, in a series of focus groups, we will be asking you about your experience and learnings during the pandemic and how this might have shaped your ideas about how to live out our calling as a congregation. Out of these conversations, we hope to identify themes and directions that will guide phase two of the process to occur in the new year. Each of you has something meaningful to add to this conversation. Six time slots will be provided in the second and third weeks of November. Four will be virtual in Zoom rooms and two will be in person here at the church with masks and social distancing, of course. So to participate in this conversation, please sign up. If you receive This Week at Knox, the weekly Knox email, just follow the link provided and register using a doodle poll. Or contact me or the office with a time slot that works best for you. Thanks, and we look forward to hearing from you. As we think about and converse about and pray about our future, we light a candle candle for our future, that the light will continue to shine brightly. The future can be exciting. The future can be frightening. I've heard it said that fear and courage come from the same place inside. If we didn't have fear, we couldn't have courage. 
with courage, with faith, in a spirit of hope and a spirit of deep trust in the presence of God, we move into the future. We live it. We live into it. Let this candle remind us of God's presence and that uh, it is with excitement and perhaps with fear, but with courage that we face the challenges ahead. We pray together. God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we offer to you who we are, your church. May we be a community of worship where your name is remembered, your presence experienced, your love embodied. Lord of encounter, we offer who we are, your church. May we be a community of prayer where your love is sought, your touch felt, your hopes revealed. Lord of the good news, we offer who we are, your church. May we be a community of revelation where gospel is proclaimed, word preached, love shown. Lord of the cross, we offer who we are, your church. May we be a community of reconciliation where the spirit of Christ is known, barriers broken down, prodigals welcomed home. Lord of compassion, we offer who we are, your church. May we be a community of acceptance where all are welcomed and valued, those who are rejected find a home where love is poured out. Lord, of those who are broken, we offer who we are, your church. May we be a community of healing where those who mourn are comforted, wounds are tended, lives made whole. Lord, of the oppressed, those who are oppressed, we offer who we are, your church. May we be a community of liberation where the pain of burden is relieved, chains are loosed, people set free. Lord, of those who are weak, we offer who we are, your church. May we be a community of empowerment where hearts and hands are strengthened, courage and faith rekindled, the gifts of your spirit bestowed. Lord of the redeemed, we offer who we are, your church. May we be a community of celebration where bread and wine are freely shared, joy and praise overflow, abundance is lived. We offer to you these prayers for our future as we offer the prayers which lie so deep within us that we cannot even begin to put them into words. We offer them all in the spirit of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And together we pray. Amen. Our closing song for the day, With the Lord as My Guide, number 574. the 
the Lord by our side. We will rise up together, strengthen each other, courage regain. With the Lord as my guide, I will rise in the morning, praise for the dawning beauty of day. With the Lord by my side, I will sing, sing forever, always a lover, seeking God's way. Siblings, brothers, sisters, like a rock, God is under our feet. Like a roof, God is over our heads. Like the horizon, God is beyond us. Like water in a pitcher, God is in us and in the pouring out of us. Like a pebble in the sea, we are in God. As God has come to you and touched your life, even in a small way this day, go now and change the world. Amen. Tu mamina, tu mamina, tu mamina, tu mamina, so man. Send me, Lord. Send me, Jesus. Send me, Jesus. Send me, Jesus. Send me, Lord. Lead us, Lord. Lead us, Jesus. Lead us, Jesus. I'm Hugh Donnelly, one of the ministers at Knox Waterloo. Thank you for being a part of the worshiping community today. You can find us online at knoxwaterloo.ca, and you are always welcome to call us at 519-886-4150. This broadcast is made possible by you, listeners and friends of Knox, who support Knox's broadcast ministry. Please consider making a donation in gratitude as you are able, and may the peace of Christ be with you.